Hello and welcome to another very special episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. Today we've been with Tracy Turner, who has had a quite interesting sales ops career. Currently VP of Revenue Operations at Trintech, but previous to that spent 20 years at a SaaS company where she progressed all the way up to, again, VP of Revenue Operations. And there's some interesting topics we're going to dive into that are related to that, but we'll get to that in a second. Tracy, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. So it, it was actually in RealPage that you, I believe, were first exposed to and moved into sales operations. Yeah, that's correct. And how did that come about? Was that proactive from your side or like, did you get pushed towards that direction? Like, How did that happen? Well, you know, I feel like I have been in and around sales my entire kind of postgraduate career. Um, however, I would say my first official kind of sales ops role was, um, was technically more on the pre-sales sales engineering side. Um, which, you know, in some places that sells up, some places it's not. But um, where I was, it was. Um, I was a part of, you know, as you said, a growing software company that we were experiencing 30 to 40 percent um, growth at the time. And, um, you know, we were in the process of moving clients from a legacy DOS application or legacy um, DOS application to a Windows um, application and then to a SaaS product. So we kind of were going through that journey. Um, and we needed to really formalize that pre-sales role. And so at that point, sales was doing all of their own demos. Um, and then, you know, I was asked to, hey, can you create this team? And so um, I started a team and within a year or two, um, moved into more of a true sales ops leadership role, um, you know, overseeing kind of the, the pre-sales and the sales ops. And prior to that, we really had sales managers doing sales ops. We didn't, you know, I think that's pretty typical, right? Especially if you go back, you know, 10 or 15 years. And, um, but, you know, it was time to grow up. We were getting a lot bigger and it was time to formalize things. And so I took that on and, um, you know, we went from a hundred million to a billion in my time there, um, you know, 500 employees to over 8,000 globally. Um, and, you know, so it, it was definitely a great learning experience. I mean, I've got, we had the opportunity to do a lot of different things and be a part of that growth. Um, and, you know, I love organization last fall, um, actually in the role of SVP of revenue operations, um, took a little break. And now I'm back kind of in a growth mode, um, you know, with a smaller SaaS company trying to recreate it all over again. Perfect. Now, talking about that smaller SaaS company, Trintech, what is the scope or the size of the sales of team and then also the size of the sales team? Uh, sure. So we kind of have two different um, business units, if you will. Um, so across both of those, you know, business units, and we're, we're global company, I mean, very much have a large footprint, um, you know, in the Nordics and in EMEA and in Australia. Um, so about half of our sales team is overseas. Um, and so I oversee both. Um, and I oversee the global organization for sales ops, um, which brings its own challenges. Um, we have, oh, about probably 30 in North America and then another 50 overseas. So just under 100. Awesome. And can you, since you've joined, can you share something that you've done that has made the reps more productive? Well, so that's a good question. Um, hopefully a lot of things, but I think, you know, we've, we've put a real focus on sales enablement um, and really looking at, you know, how we're doing the boot camp process, how we're training them, um, what are their needs. So there's some things we've been doing there around, you know, versus having a in-person boot camp where we take them out of the field for two weeks were, you know, we, we tried out a couple of virtual boot camps and some of that had to do with the COVID environment <laughs> that we're in, but, um, you know, and actually it was very successful because I think what we realized is that it enabled us to take our teams that were, um, you know, in Germany and in the UK and combine them in a boot camp with um, our reps in the United States and really kind of create this cohort 
of um, new reps that could lean on each other and learn from each other because they're selling the same, you know, um, products and solutions. It's just that they're selling it in different areas of the world. And so that had not been done before. And I think, um, so that's one thing. Um, you know, the other thing is really, we're kind of trying to get back to basics in some areas, meaning there's the company that I'm at right now has a very wide sales stack and a lot of tools. Um, but sometimes too many tools is not necessarily a great thing. Um, and so we're really looking at like getting back to foundational core, you know, account planning, territory planning, closed plans, um, all the kind of, you know, just basics of what you need to do to really put discipline back into the sales team. Got it. And I did actually want to ask about that, the tech stack. Uh, you, you say it might be a little bloated, but what, what are the core applications in there at the moment? Yeah, so uh, you could probably name one, and I'm probably using it, but um, I'll go through it. So it's, uh, you know, Salesforce, SalesLoft, Clary, uh, Inside View, Marketo, Exactly, Zoom Info, LinkedIn, Sales Navigator. Uh, we use Salesforce CPQ. DocuSign, Power BI for reporting, um, Ringlead, Opinion for training, content, you know, courses, Adaptive on the finance side, Engageo in marketing. I'm sure there's more, but those are the ones that top of my head. Yeah, okay, I think that's fine. Um, I actually wanted to ask you about this sales ops versus rev ops thing. What do you see as the core benefits of organizing towards rev ops? And I, I, I think that transition happened with you in the previous business. Were you driving that or was that someone else's agenda? Yeah, so, I mean, I wouldn't say necessarily I was driving it in my previous role. I think that um, I probably, though, cre created it without knowing I was driving it. Um, and what I mean by that is um, having been there for as many years as I had, I had a really wide knowledge of the business beyond just sales. And so I, you know, as I would get pulled into various strategic meetings or, or be asked to participate as an executive sponsor in different projects, um, it became pretty obvious that the knowledge that I had of, of you know, the customer, the products, the, the front end part of the process was very critical to also back end decisions that were being made when it came to, you know, um, in, investing in certain key strategic initiatives or, um, you know, the product launch and the go to market process and, um, you know, even budgeting and, you know, the, the quote to cash process, um, you know, and, and what is our customer experience like post implementation? Um, and how do we, you know, ensure that we're getting people, you know, going from not only, you know, our contract life, life cycle and making sure that our sales cycle is, is as fast as possible, but then also looking at, okay, that's great. But if you sell something and you can't get it implemented quickly, then you can't take revenue. So really looking at it holistically from a, you know, lead to revenue and, and, and in some respects lead to cash process, right. Versus looking at it more just on the sales side of it. And so um, that's kind of how I evolved there. Um, you know, I'm often asked and, and had to think about this a lot when I changed roles is, do I, you know, which part of the role do I enjoy the most? The, you know, the back end finance and accounting piece or the front end sales piece. And of course, the sales piece is more fun. But I, I think it's very hard to pull those two apart because it really good you know, sales ops or revenue ops leader has to understand the revenue component of the business um, because it's such a strategic role and under, understanding, you know, how you optimize processes and, you know, how you price deals, how you put your contracts together. Um, all those things impact downstream, your, you know, your, your P&L. Um, and so I think, to me, revenue operations is just that. It's having somebody who is thinking about the whole revenue cycle, um, you know, from lead generation to cash. 
Over the past few weeks, we've spoken to a hundred sales leaders around the world to understand the impact of COVID-19 on revenue. And we've combined these insights into one single report that covers the immediate impact, the commercial outlook, the tech stack that you need, and actionable advice for sales leaders. You can claim this whole report completely for free if you go to ebster.com forward slash COVID. That's ebster.com forward slash COVID. Got it, a more holistic view. I also wanted to discuss, well, you, you mentioned before the call that previous in the previous business, you guys went through a number of acquisitions where you were incorporating external businesses into the sales and sales ops team. Do you have any thoughts on how to do that effectively? Any key insights from that? Because that's not actually a topic we've broached before on this podcast. Yeah, I mean, I think probably anybody who's been around in a you know medium to large size organization um, at some point in their career has has had to be a part of either be acquired or be or be the acquiree, uh, you know, um, acquirer, I guess. Um, and so I think M and A is probably something that a lot of us, if we haven't you know been introduced to it in our career, will eventually. Um, and so. You know, I had the um, opportunity to be a part of a lot of these. We we did over thirty in my time there, and um, you know, some of them were small, some of them were, you know, ten twenty million dollar companies, but some of them were you know three four hundred million dollar companies as well. So um, very different, obviously, integrating a small organization versus a large one. I mean, you know, your ten twenty million dollar companies have one one or two sales reps that kind of hold multiple roles, and so you know when you bring that person or those people into a larger sales organization and you try to look at how do I, you know, scale, take, take their knowledge and scale it across my entire sales team. um, So I can get the benefit of the acquisition um, and the synergies there. It's fairly easy to do. You know, you take one or two people, they become kind of, you know, product experts um, and, you train the rest of the sales team, and now you know all of a sudden this person is happy as can be because they're making money off of everybody else out selling their product. What's harder is when you take a three to four hundred million dollar organization and try to fold it into you know a seven eight hundred billion dollar organization because they have a very established sales team with sales processes, their own mature sales stack. And now all of a sudden you're kind of coming in and trying to change things for them. And and they don't necessarily know what their future looks like. Um, And so that's much harder. And, you know, I don't, I don't know that there's a one size fit all answer to how to best do that. I've been a part of some that went really well and I've been part of some that went really badly. Um, So You know, I I think you have to look at the people, you have to look at what processes they have in place, you have to look at uniquely what their sales cycle looks like, and what, you know, is unique about their business, um, and their customer. And then you really have to, you know, start planning, and you can't just kind of jump in, you have to really think about very strategically, how are we going to do this? And that may mean leaving them alone for a year. (laughs) Um, you know, and letting them continue to, to sell so that you don't disrupt, you know, the current pipeline and what's going on there. Um, so definitely a unique challenge that I think many of us probably will face if we haven't already in our careers. Sure. Uh, now looking at today, I assume more of the sales team are remote. Has that changed how you have been working with the reps? So have you then any new processes or tools you put in place to to account for that? Um, yeah, I mean, I would say it has in, in a good way, uh, at least a good way from my perspective, because we have been able to engage more often um, and really get their attention. Um, whereas in the past, you know, trying to get everyone on the same call to, you know, do um, a company update or a training or anything like that was you know, almost near impossible. Whereas now it's, you know, a lot easier to do. Um, And I think people are more eager to connect, even though it's, you know, through a Zoom meeting or, you know, a Teams meeting or whatever it may be. Um, But just to be able to talk to somebody, people are, you know, eager to do that. 
Um, and I think it's the same with the customers. So while we, you know, aren't getting those in-person meetings and we don't get the opportunity to necessarily, you know, wine and dine and build relationships that way, you know, we usually can get 30 minutes on a phone call um, with folks where we maybe we would have weren't able to do that in the past. Yeah, it's I forecasting a challenge. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, that was actually my next question. Um, how, the, how have you managed to tweak the forecast? Like, what happened to the forecast during this time period? Well, it's shrunk, like I think most companies, right? There's a lot of, we're not doing anything right now. You know, we'll talk about this when this is all over. Um, so I think just, we, you have to be realistic, right? And you can't, you can't continue to expect your sales team to pull in the same numbers and the same pipeline growth that they did, you know, pre-pandemic. I mean, it's just, you're going to, you know, it's just not a fair thing to expect. Um, so I think just being there and supporting them through that process and, you know, doing whatever we can do to get creative with deals um, and help drive the pipeline that they have um, until, you know, things kind of start to return to a bit of normalcy. And then moving on to sales metrics, if you could only measure one uh, revenue related metric for the rest of your career, which would you choose? Revenue related? Yeah. Or sales related? Or revenue related. Um, gosh. Hmm. Well, I mean, aside from revenue itself, right, I think um, probably um, I mean, probably just this is so boring, but, um, you know, probably AR growth, I think, um, being a SaaS, you know, business, um, revenue growth is key. And, you know, while we don't measure this for our Greenfield or, or new logo reps, um, for our account management team or our farmers, you know, that's a key component of, you know, how we measure their performance is, you know, they have a book of business and are they driving revenue growth in that business? Um, you know, for, for, for Greenfield or the new logo reps, I mean, it, you know, the, the boring, easy one is bookings, right? I mean, did you get ACV bookings? But, um, you know, for, for the account managers, I think it would just be, are you growing the business? Because that, that involves renewals, it involves, you know, expansion add-on business, and it also involves, um, you know, stopping uh, attrition, making sure that they're not canceling or downgrading. Sure. And then a final question, who has educated or inspired you the most in the world of sales ops? I would say probably in terms of inspired, um, it would be a lady by the name of Meredith Schmidt, who was the chief um, revenue officer at Salesforce. Um, and she, she's now running their small uh, business division, but um, she I had the opportunity to, to go to the Salesforce office and spend some time meeting with her and learning about, you know, their process and how they dealt with quote to cash and, and all of that. And so, um, you know, for me, that was inspiring to, to see, cause you know, obviously Salesforce has gone to through tremendous growth, um, and is, you know, a best in class CRM system. And so, you know, just learning about her journey. She had also been with Salesforce for very, you know, decades. Um, so, yeah, I would say it's probably her. Shout out to Meredith. Amazing. Okay, so I hear a couple of things that I liked. I totally agree with your point on RevOps versus SalesOps and having someone with that more holistic take or view of revenue is it, probably the reason why a lot of businesses are shifting to that now. Um, and then on the other side, your your M and A points, I think, are going to be super valuable for people that may be going through that or may may have gone through that previously. Especially the one I thought was most interesting is if you do have a big sales team that you're bringing into yours that have been selling together for a long time, why not just leave them doing their thing for a while before you try and move everything around and potentially mess stuff up? I thought that was really um, 
insightful. Trafi, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me.